before going back to material, uh, I'll remind you that the second midterm exam is coming up. It's on Monday uh, in class. It will cover <laughs> primarily material since just after the first midterm to, to today. So the material from carousels and roller coasters up into partway into the world of balls and air. So if I don't get to it today, then by and large it won't be on the exam. Uh, there won't be anything beyond that, you know, airplanes in the world of heat and thermodynamics. That's all still in our future. I will have some questions that reach back into the first exam material, in part because it's sort of d difficult to disentangle. Uh, you know, physics just keeps building on itself and so on. Uh, in honor of the exam, I'm going to hold my office hour, my Monday office hours in the morning on this coming Monday. So I'll be at Alderman Cafe 9 to 11 if you've got questions. Any other thoughts? OK. Uh, last time, I, to an extent, I finished with guard watering, but I wanted to, to make sure I've done justice to some of the key features of, of, of the story there. Because it really it, it takes us from the world of, of, of perfect flow, which was back in, I did that uh, in, in, in water distribution. In the world of garden watering, there are all these issues like the fact that, that water has viscosity, that it rubs against itself so it doesn't flow perfectly out th through plumbing, it, it wastes some of what I call its ordered energy, the energy associated with its gravitational potential energy, its pressure potential energy, its kinetic energy. Those are ordered energies. You can do work with them. They're, they're easily uh, harnessed to do things of, of value. It converts some of that into thermal energy, which is not, you can't do work with it directly. It's much harder to deal with. It's all ground up into little fragments. So the flow, viscosity, chews up ordered energy. And the faster the flow is, the faster it chews up that energy. So I think, I think that one's OK. Any questions about the, the influence of viscosity and the flow of fluids? It affects all of fluids. It affects air flowing through pipes uh, just as much as it affects water flowing through pipes. It certainly affects honey and molasses going through pipes, or things like pipes. OK, the other things that I, that I discussed that I want to make sure I've, I've done proper justice to is is not this screen yet, but when, wa when air or, or any fluid accelerates for reasons other than gravity, it's doing it because of pressure differences. It's got high pressure on one side, low pressure on another, or, or an, some position around it, and it's accelerating as a result. And those pressure differences are kind of interesting and, and uh, often useful, and they do weird things. And so, uh, a dem well, I got two demonstrations I can do with that. Um, this one, tap into the compressed air here. So I've got a source of air under the table here that will just go through, uh, deliver high pressure air to the tube. The air rushes through the tube, comes out the end. There's a little bit of a hmm, tiny bit of a nozzle there. So it's coming in at high pressure. It is converting its pressure into kinetic energy. It's rubbing on the pipe, so it's losing some of its energy. But in any case, it comes roaring out of there at high at high speed and therefore high kinetic energy. It's turning pressure potential energy from some compressor somewhere into kinetic energy. You know, whoosh, off it goes. Well, that by itself is boring. I mean, you've seen that sort of thing a thousand times. But if I put a plate up against the other plate, so the air's coming out of the middle of the plate. If I bring the plate against that plate, it creates a very narrow channel, uh, you know, flat channel through which the air can spread out and leave. And as the air goes into that channel, like going into a nozzle, it has to speed up. It's, being, it's, it's, it's got a narrow thing to pass through, so it has to convert its pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. It goes very fast. It goes so fast, in fact, and, and, and that it converts a lot of its pressure potential energy into, into, into a kinetic. And in that region where it's separated, from the, protected from the outside world, because in this channel, it's going, to be, it's going to be covered with plastic on the top, cardboard, or no, plastic on the bottom. Um, the outside pressure just isn't an issue. It can actually go below atmospheric pressure in that channel, having converted so much of its pressure potential energy into kinetic energy that its pressure dropped below the, the average, the ordinary pressure. And when that happens, watch what happens to the, to the two plates. Do I have enough? More pressure, more pressure. 
Actually, more flow is really the issue. They seem to stick to one another. They're held against each other by the fact that the pressure between those two plates is less than atmospheric pressure. And so the air pushing on the bottom of that blue plate is, is supporting its weight against uh, gravity. So the, you're okay with the idea the pressure between these plates is a little below atmospheric. If it pinches off too much, then the flow stops. And it, it, there's a negotiation process here to get it just right. Turn off the flow and the two fall apart. You okay with why that happened? Yeah, Liam? Why is the pressure lower between the plates? Because the, the air was coming along, actually at quite high pressure in the, in, the, in the tube, well above atmospheric pressure. And then it had to go through this very narrow crack between the two plates. And as it goes through the, the crack, it has to speed up a lot in order for the same amount of flow that was, going, that was coming down the pipe to go through that crack. It has to go 10 times as fast, you know, much faster. And to do that, it had to accelerate forward and use some of its pressure potential energy to speed up and become kinetic energy. And the pressure went down from maybe five times atmospheric pressure in the, in the tube to less than one atmosphere in the, in the, between the crack. Actually, less, less than, than the background one, at, one pr uh, atmosphere that's just in our room in general. Is that OK? In that, in that protected environment, there's nothing special about atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is, is the one we're swimming in right now. But if you build a box and go inside the box, it's totally sealed. And everything. Atmospheric pressure is, is unimportant. You can have everything from high pressure to zero, to real zero. OK? That's one version of the same demonstration. I'll do another one, another version. This is just a, so a air coming out of a funnel. And by itself, the air comes out. Actually, it goes a little bit, I guess, through a diffuser. So the pressure is a little bit funny in here. But, but I'm not going to do it for very long wide open. I'm, instead, I'm going to put a ball into it. And the ball is going to create a, a narrow crack between where the ball touches the funnel and the ball. And the air is going to have to go very fast through that little crack. That will be on the top of the ball. And in that region, the pressure will drop below atmospheric pressure again. And the ball will stick. Is that OK? So you can get pressure flow. When you get strong flows, you can get pressures that drop below atmospheric pressure. Any questions more about these two demonstrations? I think the other ones I'm going to save for a, for a minute. We'll come back to them. OK. So when air, when air is forced to accelerate in various ways, it develops pressure imbalances that are interesting. Let me just remind you this. Let me go back to where is that drawing? This one, that, that when air or water, any of them, uh, undergo a bend, uh, in this case a, a right angle bend, and we're looking down on this right angle bending flow that, 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 that came along. So, so we're, we're looking down on it to get rid of gravity. The flow entered like this and, and left like this. So it enters heading up in our picture and rightward when it leaves. To, in, to do that bend, it has to accelerate. And like anything that, that goes around a turn, it accelerates toward the center of the turn, more or less. You do this when you're driving your car and you turn left. You go around the center of the turn. You're, uh, you're accelerating toward your left. This is, in this case, it's, you, know, you could be driving along and turning to your right, accelerating towards the inside of that turn. And for this to happen in the fluid, it has to develop a pressure imbalance between high pressure on the outside of the turn and, uh, and low pressure on the inside of the turn. And it's that pressure imbalance that pushes on, the, on the, the water or whatever fluid it is and causes it to accelerate and complete the turn. OK? It, it also develops speed, changes in speed. It travels fastest on the inside of the turn and slowest on the outside of the turn. They, they all go hand in hand. Uh, the, the, the changes in pressure, the changes in speed, they're, going to, they're, they're, they're working in tandem to make this all happen. You OK with that? Let me go back to the view graph that I, that I had up here earlier. Another peculiarity about, about the real world, uh, real world flows, water's real behavior. Um, and that is that water doesn't always flow, undergo laminar flow, smooth, orderly flow, where you can 
you can follow streamlines. Um, the idea with, with, with the laminar flow is if you put a, a pattern, I, and I told you this last time, but I'll repeat it anyway. If you put a pattern of ink dots in, into a, a laminar flow, a smooth, slow-moving river, for example. You, you, you put down, a, a, you, you draw a picture there of dots. They'll move along through the river. They may get changed there. The pattern may evolve, because some of the water may move faster than, than others, depending on turns and accelerations and stuff. But it, the pattern's basically going to stay intact the whole way. And if you know where one or two or three of the dots are of ink, you can predict where the other ones are going to be. And if you made the pattern over and over again, it would, it would evolve the same way time after time. That's laminar flow. The other possibility, or the, or the other extreme possibility, is turbulent flow. And turbulent flow is, is the, 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 the hallmarks of it are things like, like vortices, swirling things. And in, in a turbulent flow, like a whitewater river, you put your pattern of, of dots in upstream and you, and you watch them move along, they get separated to, to, to arbitrary distances. They do not stay intact as a pattern. And so knowing where one or two of the dots are, if you can even find any of them, won't tell you anything about where the other ones are. They're just shredded. Okay, you've got the picture between the two. You've seen turbulent flow. It's just this churning, messy stuff, white water. Whereas laminar flow is smooth, steady flow. Uh, you can barely see anything's happening often. Okay, what distinguishes uh, one from the other? What causes one or, or causes the other? And the difference really has to do with the, which dominates. Viscous effects would favor laminar flow or inertial effects which favor turbulent flow. Viscous effect, why do viscous effects and viscous forces uh, encourage laminar flow? Because viscosity, along with wasting energy when things slide across each other, fights to keep them from, from being in relative motion. It wants all the water, or whatever fluid you've got in mind, to move together as one. So if you've got a chunk of water that's heading fast, near a, a chunk of water that's heading slow, it wants to bring them together and make them move together. It'll slow down the faster moving one, speed up the slower moving one, they'll try to go together. So viscosity favors order and laminar flow. Consequently, things that are highly viscous, honey, molasses, tar, um, they tend, they have trouble becoming turbulent. I mean, you pour them, they, they pour smooth and neat, neat. imagine a pitcher full of of maple syrup, you pour it out, this beautiful smooth flow comes out and waves back and forth on the pancakes or whatever it is, right? That's viscosity, encouraging laminar smooth flow. In contrast, inertia is, favors turbulent flow. It's because then every chunk of the fluid, if it's got a lot of inertia, or, or, or in, in other words, a lot of momentum, it, it's, it's for itself, you know, ignore everybody else. Every, it's a free-for-all. Everybody goes their own way. They may be talking to each other a little bit by way of viscosity, but they don't care much about each other. So one goes one way, one goes the other, they just rip apart. All right, so inertia favors turbulence. And uh, if you put, and that, that's what this, this, this number, what's called the Reynolds number, after Oswald Reynolds, uh, is simply the ratio of inertial influences to viscous influences. It has no dimensions. All the dimensions cancel, where dimensions are things like meters and seconds and newtons, whatever. They all cancel out. And it's simply, uh, you look at the density of the fluid, den more density, more mass per volume favors inertia. Uh, bigger obstacles to go around gives inertia uh, more territory to rip stuff apart with. So obstacle length matters. The speed with which the fluid is flowing favor is, is associated with inertia and momentum and, and favors uh, uh, turbulence. And lastly, uh, down there in the, in the new denominator is viscosity, trying desperately to keep everybody organized. And if you put, the, for a given situation, you put in its, the, the fluid's density, the obstacles that it's having to deal with, no obstacles, you won't get turbulence. But the obstacles will introduce turbulence. What, 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 how big are they? Speed and viscosity. You come out with a number, and as a, as a general rule of thumb, not to be taken too seriously, if that turns out to be a number less than about 2,000, as if you, you know, you guys will never be calculating that, 
in all likelihood ever. But if it comes out less than 2,000, that means viscosity is dominating. And you get probably laminar-ish flow. Um, if it's greater than about 2,000, you tend to get turbulence. And the transition, is, it depends on the situation. But there's, that sort of a, gives you a ballpark for where the transition occurs. And to put, th put things in perspective, when I was playing in the last time in a, in a dish of fluid that was sort of water-like, you go th you, the, if I move my finger, if, I stick my if you stick your finger in water, I mean, you can just do this. And it you're going to stir a cup of coffee, you've got nothing around except your finger, or maybe a, a, small, a spoon the size of your finger, whatever. If you go slowly through the coffee, slowly being like about this, you're below 2,000. You get laminar flow. This is not how to mix the sugar into your coffee, because the flow is too, too smooth and clean, and nothing is churning. But you know if you go about like this, you've exceeded 2,000, and you, you go into the territory of turbulence. So you, so you experience this all the time when you're stirring stuff up in, the, in, in beverages. Right about there, you go through the transition from laminar if you go slow to turbulence if you go fast. OK? And, and you, you, you have learned from long experience, turbulence is the way you get things to mix. You want the milk to mix in, psh, go fast. Um, since viscosity is the, the, fi the, the ordering feature, and the viscosity of the air is exquisitely low. It's not zero, but it's quite low. Air has a tough time staying laminar in most circumstances, as we will see shortly. So, so when I'm walking along like this, I'm the obstacle. The air is flowing past me from my perspective, and the air goes turbulent. It's just unavoidable. For me to walk through the air at a speed low enough to have Reynolds number below 2,000, I would have to, you know, I'd probably have to. I'll just hold my hand out and let my fingernails grow into it. Okay, you've got to go really slow. So air loves to go turbulent, not enough viscosity. Okay? I guess you have to mix cornstarch in it. <laughs> no, that won't help you. Okay? All right. Um, the last thing I, any, actually, any questions about Reynolds number and the, the idea, or at least turbulence versus viscosity and why we get one of their, Dakota? How did the density affect it? The dense, uh, that's, a, that's actually an interesting question. Because um, the air has a very low density, and therefore you think that inertia gets, gets creamed by it. Density, what was that? Density was, um, it is associated with inertia. As you lower density, it's easier for viscosity to keep things orderly. Because density is, tells you how much mass there is, how much tendency to keep doing what you're doing if there is. Uh, as you shift from water to, to air, the density goes down by about a factor of 1,000. But the viscosity goes down by a much larger factor. So, so air's viscosity is so much smaller. Uh, the, 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 the main feature of shifting from water to air is that the, de the viscosity just plummets. And I, I, maybe I said this wrong. I'm listening to myself and, and thinking, what did, what did I just say? Um, in shifting from water to air, the density goes down by a factor of 1,000. Viscosity goes down by a much bigger factor. And you lose you, you, the Reynolds number um, skyrockets. Is that OK? <sighs> An example of a fluid, that, I'm going to think of mercury. Liquid mercury has actually a surprisingly small viscosity and enormous density. We used to have big pots of mercury over in the lecture demo collection, which was, a, which was fun to play with, but it's pretty toxic. And you never, oh, you know, we, we got rid of all the really nasty stuff, at least most of them. Right. OK. Uh, water hammer, or just the, just the idea that water has, has momentum. I did, I did this at the end of class in a flurry. Just the basic idea is, is a lot of what I've talked about, apart from this moment, is flows that are just keep ongoing. They, we never talked about starting them. We never talked about stopping them. What happens if you just stop the flow of water in a pipe? Well, when you do that, you've had this, you've had this flow going along with momentum in it, and you, and you turn off the flow. That momentum's got to go somewhere. And it's transferred to something by way of an impulse. And in the case of a, of a fluid exerting an impulse, since fluids don't push with a simple force, they push with pressure applied to surface, the impulse takes the form of a pressure applied to a surface times time. And if the time is long, then the pressure can be low. 
Uh, if the time is short, the pressure has to be high. So what does that mean? That means that if you, if you have water going through a pipe and you slam closed a valve in the pipe very abruptly and you force the water to stop in a thousandth of a second, it's going to transfer all of its momentum to the plumbing near that end point, near the, near the valve, by way of a huge surge in pressure for a short time. So the pressure will skyrocket right there at the, at the face of that valve. And where this was most, you know, most notable, noticeable in houses that weren't carefully plumbed was, was uh, clothes washers often have electric valves in them, solenoid valves that are fired electrically, open closed water. And when they would, they would open to let the water go in, and then when, the, when, when, they're, when they're done, they're ready to start churning a load of laundry, they close the water valve and they close it very fast, and the water in the house suddenly has to stop. And certainly as, as a kid growing up, the, the, the pipes in my house would go after that. Do any of you have houses that, that have that? When the, when the washer is going on, you hear the pipes going periodically? That exact frequency, not no, sorry. Oh, whatever. Um, you can avoid this. The classic way to avoid that shaking thing is to put an air pocket into the pipe, feeding the water into the, dry, into the washer. And so a, a, a careful plumber will put an air pocket in, a, ver a vertical pipe that traps air and acts as a little spring. So when the momentum is transferred to the pipe uh, during that impact, um, it, it compresses the, the air and, and spreads out the impulse in time. All right? Where, so that's, that's one version of, of what, this is called water hammer because a hammer transfers all its momentum to a nail in a very short period of time by way of a huge force. This is water transferring all of its momentum to the pipes in a short period of time by way of a huge pressure surge. And I showed you this little gadget that it, it's just a, a water hammer demonstrator. And the way it works, to, to remind you, because it's not, it's not intuitive, is you take the, the gadget, which has water at the bottom right now and an air pocket, an elaborate air pocket at the top, and you make it accelerate downward rapidly. Now, of course, I can only hold the glass, so I can make the glass go down, but the water won't go down. It won't experience much force at all, and it will stay in place, and the glass will leave the water behind, so the water goes up into the top to, to a large extent. Everybody follow that okay? Then I stop accelerating the, the, the gadget. I, 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 go, I accelerate down fast, and then I stop it, or even accelerate upward. At that point, the compressed air up at the top will push the water back and cause it to accelerate. It will begin to catch up with the glass, and it will hit the bottom of the glass with moving fast. So the water will now have momentum downward. It will hit the glass and have to transfer all of its momentum to the glass very quickly. It's, it's hitting a solid wall, and you can hear it hit. That's just water hitting, hitting glass. And if you do, you're welcome to play with this after class. Don't go harder than I'm doing here, because you can cause damage. It hits really hard. Is that okay? The more fun one, I'll do this one more time, okay, is this one, so it's just a, it's a, essentially a full bottle of, of root beer here. Uh, it's got the air pocket in there. You don't want it completely full of water, and you, don't want, you want the top closed, because you want, you want to make it accelerate downward. In principle, I could do it the same way. Can I get it? I don't know. It's too hard. But in principle, I get the same smack sound. Make, it, make the glass accelerate downward. The water doesn't go, go with it. Then the water accelerates downward and catches up with the bottom of the bottle and hits it. Everybody can follow that idea? By hand, it's hard to do it. With a mallet, you can hear it hit. Knocks the bottom out of the bottle. Okay? Uh, and I, I, many years ago, I was, at, I was shopping at one of the grocery stores, and a woman was taking bottles out of her cart at the checkout, and she clipped the bottom of the, of the counter with one of the bottles. It's exactly the same physics. She, that's a rapid downward acceleration of the bottle. Right? It, was, it was moving up, velocity upward, but it was stopped abruptly. The whole same motion went, went, took place, and the bottom blew out of her bottle. 
onto the floor at the checkout counter. And she's like, how did that ever happen? Hopefully now you understand why that would happen. It, you absolutely can do this. You, this there, variations of this that can be used to knock the cork out of a wine, wine bottle. What else? Um, I, I told you last time, it is possible, I've seen people do this, to take a bottle with no covering, still full of water up to about here, and just go smack like that hard enough, hard enough, the whole motion occurs, the whole up and down, but you end up with, with uh, decorations on your hand later. Yeah, Dakota? How does the, how does the air pocket uh, affect the, the process? The air pocket serves two purposes. One is to give room for the water to get away from the bottom. So you have to have an empty space up there. It could, in principle, be vacuum, I guess. But, but having air there allows it to, 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 to come off the bottom and then compress the air up on top. And then when the bottle stops, the compressed air helps accelerate the, the water downward so that it hits the bottom. So you really do want an air pocket there. Is there an idea? There probably is, and people have probably optimized the size of the air pocket for this guy. For those guys, I haven't tinkered very much, but, but properly filled is about, is, works nicely. All right, so if you all have, uh, you know, rather than just recycling the glass, you can recycle it the, the complicated way. Any other question? All right. So, oh, well, I'll tell you one more possibly apocryphal story, because it's fun anyway, is that, that at some dormitory somewhere or other, the deal was when the bell rang for 12 o'clock, it's in the era before people had cell phones that were accurate to the fraction of a second, but okay. So when the bell rang, just prior to it, everybody opened the faucets. And just as the bell rang, they all closed the faucets and blew up the water main feeding the, feeding the dorm. So don't do that one. Whether it actually happened or not, I, I've never tracked that one down. It's, that could easily be a Mythbusters bust. Um, I have seen, however, there was, a, there was a case, actually at five points in, in, in town, where firefighters were, were uh, too rapidly closed the, the, the uh, fire hydrants during a, during a, a drill, and they blew out a 10-foot length of, of water main. I, I used to have a picture of that somewhere. So it is quite possible to use water hammer to destroy plumbing. Okay? It was old pipes and they had to be replaced anyway, but they but they sped it they sped its death up dramatically. Okay. So balls in air. Uh, I already did bouncing balls, which is part of the story of, of life with balls and ball sports. Air is, an, is the other major part of life with balls and, and uh, tremendously influential on virtually all balls except maybe a shot put, which can cut through the air and you know, it's so dense and travels so slowly, it just it pre probably pretty much ignores the air. But all the other balls I can think of uh, are at the mercy of the air. And I'll ask, this introductory question is a fairly sophisticated question which there's no reason you would get right or wrong at this point, but just here's the idea. That if you're standing on a, on a bridge overlooking a, a smoothly flowing stream, think, smoothly flowing, think laminar flow. It's going by in laminar flow, and the water encounters a cylindrical post on which the bridge, sit, bridge sits. As the water encounters that post, the water level may or may not stay constant. It may actually rise or fall, and the question is, on the sides of the post, is that water level higher, lower, or at normal river level? Can you, can you picture the story here? The, 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 level, the water was smooth and level everywhere else. When it encounters the post, who knows? So how many think that the water level on the sides of the post is higher, A? Okay, how about lower? How about equal? Pretty, pretty even distribution between higher and lower and a few for equal. So we got some, got some work to do. And I'll give it away for the, just because I, I will, in case I don't get to it. It's actually lower on the sides. Um, it dips down as it, goes around, as it goes around the sides. And you can see this in context other than just the post. 
a, a big a boat going through the water is a lot like a cylinder, a cylindrical post with water coming out of it. They're, it's the boat moving instead of the water moving. But if you look at the front of the boat, there's a, there's a rise in, in the water level at the front of the boat. And then it dips down, and it, it's actually low on the sides. On the early sides of the boat, it actually goes below average level. There's a dip. And that's the dip, the same dip that you see on the sides of the post. Beyond, on the back, of the back of the boat or the back of the post, life is complicated. Uh, it may well get turbulent. OK. So, so the issue is to look at with balls and air. Uh, it, it's all about, all about the influences of, of the air on the ball. And there are things like air resistance. Um, the various types of air resistance. The flow around the ball has interesting effects on it. Um, we'll look also at, at I mean, the, the, why, do curve, why do some balls have dimples? Really, to some balls is golf balls. Uh, I, I hoped early on that, that tennis balls would have the same physics going on, but they don't, apparently. People study, do, do the dimples on, t on golf balls are very important. The fuzz on tennis balls, not so important. Uh, it's not equivalent to dimples. And spinning balls, which are, are, are part of almost every sport, almost every ball sport, spinning balls do interesting things. They don't experience just air resistance. They actually experience forces that push them to the, to the side and make them turn. And uh, in baseball, it's called a curveball, or, or, and curveballs, uh, there are variations also, other names. In, in some of the other, other games, tennis, for example, there's a curveball that's routinely used that actually curves down so you can hit it super fast over the net and still have it hit the court in bounds. So spinning balls are critical to, to, well, to tennis and many other sports. Uh, so a little question here. If air resistance slows a ball down, what happens to the ball's momentum? Right? Ball, a ball hit forward through the air uh, is, is going along 100 miles an hour, then 70, 90 miles an hour, 80, 70. It's slowing down. It's giving up forward momentum. Where does that momentum go? And how many think it's given to the entire Earth? A. How about given to the air near the ball? B. How about it becomes potential momentum? Good. There is no such thing. How about it becomes thermal momentum? Good. There's no such thing. It's B. It's given to the, to the air near the ball. So the ball and the air are talking a lot. Uh, and the ball gives forward moment, it's some of its forward momentum to the air as it goes through it. So how is that possible? What, you know, why does a ball experience air resistance? And it's transferring momentum to the air. So the, name, the type of forces, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll identify sort of on, on the, the general, general scale two different types of forces that are called aerodynamic forces. Why aero? Because it's got to do with the air. Why dynamic? Because it's got to do with movement through the air, or movement of the air past something. So relative motion, if nothing else. The two types of forces are drag forces, and those are what we associate with air resistance, and lift forces. Drag forces are all of the forces that uh, slow down a ball moving through air. That is, they push it opposite its velocity through calm air. So if the air, if the ball is, you know, pick a ball. So if the ball is moving to the right, as you view it, through calm air, to make life simple, don't have no wind just to keep things down, it's, it, the ball is pushed to the left, opposite its velocity. And this slows it down. So, so drag forces always slow down, uh, reduce the relative velocity between the ball and the air. Um, there are no drag forces. They never speed it up. They never push it in the direction of its motion. It's always opposite. It's just like it's like sliding friction. All right. So those are drag forces. What you know, we think? Well, so what? What could possibly uh, be another type of force? There are forces. Uh, not so much with balls, although they are there with balls, but a lot with planes, in which as as the object, the ball, moves to the right through the air. The air pushes it not backward, not, not opposite its, its velocity, but at right angles to its velocity through the air, namely upward, which, which makes the word lift seem quite sensible, but also potentially toward you, away from you, or downward. Those are all technically lift forces. They're at right angles to the airflow past the ball. 
that they're called lift forces is a little awkward because, remember, they're not necessarily upward. It depends on the situation. You can get lift forces that are downward. Okay? So the two, the two they, they, they make a complete set. Drag forces are, are essentially downwind. They push, the, the ball is pushed in the direction of the air passing by it. Um, and lift forces are at right angles to the air flowing by it. They're, uh, yeah. Okay? Two, just two categories. All right, so, so what are the possibilities? There are three different types of drag force. They're at the bottom of that list there. There's a surface friction effect just of having air you pick a bigger ball. This ball, when it moves through the air, you know, it slows down significantly even by the time it gets to the wall. The air flowing around its surface rubs on the surface by way of viscous stuff. The same things we saw in, in uh, water flow through a pipe. And that sucks some of the forward momentum out of the ball. And that's known as viscous drag. It's drag force because it's, it's opposite the ball's viscosity through the air, not velocity through the air. And it's called viscous drag because it's associated with the, with the viscous rubbing effects. OK? That would seem like that's all there is possible. But no, there is another effect that's due to turbulence. Uh, as the ball moves through the air, it leaves behind it air that is, has been churned up and, and, and full of swirls and eddies and the vortices. And that, that the drag associated with that is known as pressure drag. It has to do with an imbalance of pressure on, on the, around the ball. The ball is not, it's not symmetric and it, it pushes the ball uh, backwards opposite its, opposite its velocity through the air. Okay? There is a third type of drag that we'll barely touch on that comes about because uh, when you obtain lift in, 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 uh, in air, for example, there is a cost to it. You, 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 you're pushing on the air to, to get the lift force, and the air carries away some of your precious energy, and associated with that energy being stolen from you is a loss of energy, and therefore a loss of forward momentum. Or loss, of, loss of speed, I should say, not forward momentum, because that sounds like energy and momentum are inter can be converted to one another, they're not. Okay, the main point is there are two key types of, of drag that you guys encounter all the time. One of them is viscous drag, one of them is pressure drag, and I have to elaborate a lot to make them, uh, to separate those two. Okay? So, um, so how does the air flow around a ball? And it turns out it depends on Reynolds number. I've already told you about that. Remember, low Reynolds number means viscosity is winning and you therefore get uh, laminar flow. High Reynolds number, you tend to get turbulent flow. That's, that's all that's necessary here at this point. All right, so let's see what happens if you have low Reynolds number and therefore laminar flow. If a ball is moving through the air, or the air is moving past the ball, and I should, I should just make sure that, that I, I flip back and forth between these things cavalierly, but I don't really want to leave you behind in doing it. We can either move a ball through calm air to, to watch what the pattern of flow that moves past it, or we can have the ball stationary and have a gentle, steady wind go by. It's the same physics, it's just a question of sort of which one's moving from our frame of reference. And just to make life simple for us, let's adopt the, the convention where the ball is stationary and a gentle wind is coming at it. It's at least a smooth wind. Parker? What would happen if the ball were moving and there were also a wind? Then you have these sort of situations where, where one is moving toward the other and the other is moving toward it. There's an approach speed that's going on. So you can figure it out. If, if the ball is moving 20 kilometers an hour that way and the wind's blowing 20 kilometers that way, they're approaching each other at 40 kilometers per hour, right? You can, you, we, can, can, we can work in that situation, but it's so hard. So what we do is we sort of jump on the ball and move with it. And now the wind is coming at us at 40 kilometers an hour, and the ball, from, from our new perspective, is motionless. Is that okay? So we're on the ball, watching the, the air go by us. Is it okay? Or questions about that? In that case, the drawing I've got here has the, has the wind going, coming by from, from left to right. 
and it goes around the ball. Obviously, can't go through it. So what happens? As it encounters the surface of the ball, it has to spread out. It can't go through the ball, so it has to, the, the air that, that hits above the midline wraps around the ball above it, and the air that hits below the midline wraps around the ball below it. Well, that involves bending. The flow actually has to, to bend, and therefore it has to accelerate. Right? It's, it's as though there were a pipe here that's, 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 that's taking the air that was flowing along horizontally, happy and, and content, and arcing it upward. Whoa! And if you remember what happens to the, to the pressures inside a pipe for when, when, the, when the, the air bends or the water bends, there is low pressure on the inside of the curve and high pressure on the outside of the curve. So in this case, there's high pressure on the outside of the curve, which is down here, right at, at close to the ball, and lower pressure out here on the inside of the curve. So there's high pressure to low pressure. And if you get far enough away from the ball, that so-called low pressure is just the ambient pressure of the air around, so-called atmospheric pressure. So there's atmospheric pressure out here. There has to be higher than atmospheric pressure here. And there is. At the front of a ball moving through the air, the pressure hitting its front surface is higher than atmospheric. So I can't make the air move past the ball. Well, it's, OK, let, let me pretend. The air is rushing. Let me do it. The air is rushing along. The air as it comes in here and spreads around, bend, bends around, bends around, that's high pressure air right here. If you put a little gauge in there, or if it were a really big ball and you could go in there and stand there, the pressure would rise above atmospheric pressure. All right? It's real. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just like, oh, this is abstract physics on the charts. It's, it's a real effect. OK, so the air, the pressure there is high. Uh, uh, to obtain that higher pressure, it has to convert kinetic energy into pressure potential energy. The air slows down. So the air here is moving relatively slowly. You can see that in part because the streamlines are, wide, are separated from one another widely. The air has slowed down, spread out. All right. As the air then continues around the ball, it has to bend the other way. For it's, it was heading up and to the right here, and now it has to go horizontally, and then it has to go down and to the, and to the right. That arc is a bend toward the center of the ball. So this is now the inside of a curve. This is the inside. That's the outside. And remember, the pressure is higher on the outside, lower on the inside of a curve. So out here, where the pressure is, is, should be higher, in this re, for, for relatively higher, it's atmospheric pressure out here again. This is, this is so far away now that, that the ball hasn't affected it. So this is atmospheric pressure. The pressure must be dropping. This is lower than atmospheric pressure air right there. It's truly below atmospheric pressure. So again, to illustrate this by hand, the air comes rushing in, high pressure here, low pressure here. Low pressure, low pressure, low pressure, all the way around the, the, this, I don't know what to call it, so it's a sideways equator of the ball. It's low pressure there. You OK with that idea? We'll get to what happens. Oh, I'll, I'll do what happens to the, in the back here, and then I'll I'll put some, some limitations on it. When the air continues to the back of the ball, it has to bend away from the ball again. It, it, here it bent away from the ball, then toward the ball, then away from the ball to, to leave, to be left behind. And that bend, this bend, is another one away from the ball. It centers out here somewhere. And so this is the lower pressure. That's the higher pressure. And sure enough, there's higher pressure near the ball surface, at the back of the ball. It's a, it's a weird, not intuitive result. But that means that as the air comes rushing around the ball, high pressure, low pressure on the side, and then high pressure on the back, and then leave. Is that OK? Uh, before I go too far, I want to show you the low pressure on the side. High pressure on the front. Um, you, you're familiar with, if I, if I spray water at the, if I spray water or air at this ball, Ah, no, it's not a good. It's not a good demonstration. I'm not going to do it. I, I, I'm going to show you this one instead. If I take a a little piece of glass, a glass tube here. Actually, I, I can. We can zoom in on this one. I keep forgetting to use the. 
So that'll see. There's a little dome on the top of this tube. So it's half, it's half a ball, right? The, the tube is the lower half of the ball. The top half is a ball. And I'm going to make water, uh, sorry, no, air. Air go pass across the top of the ball. And the, 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 the air will hit the, hit the front of the ball, high pressure, over the top, low pressure, the back, maybe high pressure again. But that low pressure on the top, it's lower than atmospheric pressure. And there's a little hole drilled in that, in that piece of glass. It's a little pipe. It goes down into the water. And as the pressure drops at the top, as the air goes over the top, the, that's low pressure. It will, it will suck water up the straw, just like it were you sucking up it. And the water will go into the airflow, and it will create a familiar effect, but explain why it happens. You could do it with natural gas, but it's not very much pressure. And it would make every possibility for me to burst into flames, which I, I'll save for another day. OK, so, oh. Stay on. No fog. This is how paint sprayers work, or perfume, the old perfume bottles. Can you see the water getting sucked up and, and, and blasted? Right? Come back here. It, it wanted to remind me that I can use it in a demonstration, too. So, so you, you okay that there was low pressure on the sides of the ball? It, it's, it's real. It's real enough to suck water up into it and create a paint sprayer or a perfume sprayer. Uh, what, this, what this guy wanted, had in mind, of course, when I try to pull it off, it's hard to pull off. When it blows off, it's easy. Okay. That effect, where, where it, was try, it, was, it was sitting in this flow, it's, it's supported by a force that I haven't done, dealt with yet, which is uh, pressure drag. But whenever it tries to leave the flow, the airflow around its surface does that bend that creates low pressure on the side that's still immersed in the flow. And you get low pressure only on the side of the ball that's immersed in the flow, and, the, uh, and, and full atmospheric pressure on the far side the ball gets pushed back into the flow every time it tries to leave. On, on a bigger scale. Right, so just, I want to make sure that you understand it before I do it. So every time the ball tries to leave, the, the force that supports the ball, I haven't done yet. The force that causes it to go back into the flow, that's the low pressure on that curve on the sides of the ball, uh, allowing the higher pressure outside to pull it back in. So, Okay, so we, we won't get to what distinguishes this kind, I, I should say, this ball experiences viscous drag. As that air goes around the sides, it does experience a drag force because of rubbing. But most real balls experience another force known as pressure drag, which I haven't done properly, and, and, and neither of them will be on the exam because I haven't done them properly. All right, see you on Monday. <laughs>